had the internet and I uh, I started you know Googling or Yahooing or also visiting uh, the different drugs she was on and you know different things that her medical records said. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get an idea of like what was going on with her mother and why she couldn't walk anymore and why she was saying she was in intense pain. Um, and that kind of led me through a bunch of different bio fields, including ecology and uh, oh, I got uh, so I, I've done some ecology and environmental restoration out in the West, uh, and then I, I started reading about biofuels, and I became interested in bioengineering um, and getting cells to pump out oil molecules. And just like skimming it off the surface of a, of a you know, an algae growth pond. Um, and it turns out there's a lot of other people thinking the same along the same lines. Lots of different methodologies that are being applied. Um, but what's central to the engineering side of things, the bioengineering side, is having DNA. And uh, you know, starting like 50 years ago or more, we figured out that we could sometimes take some material and uh, transform it, like add it to another bacteria, and that bacteria would gain characteristics of uh, the former. And then we learned that, that material was nucleic acid and DNA, and we started figuring out, like, you know, if we can get a certain size fragment, that always works. And uh, those are usually much smaller than the genomic DNA, they're called plasmids. And so these are sort of like auxiliary DNA pieces that can be. Uh, between certain organisms be just easily handed off or acquired or picked up and uh, add new functionality or, or mutate their other inherent functionalities into something new or broken or... Uh. So at the core of all this is having DNA and I was reading about all these cool things that I was interested in and uh, you know, there's a paper, a really cool organism, they found some really cool piece of DNA that did some, you know, awesome thing, but they were isolated from the environment and, you know, stored in Stockholm and in some, like, old guy's freezer that doesn't answer email. Uh, but then, you know, a lot of papers in the past maybe 35 years started having DNA sequences of these pieces of DNA. And uh, now we have a digital text file of these piece of DNA, these parts, uh, so why do I need to cut them out of, you know, something I found in the soil? Why can't I just make the DNA from the text file, have, you know, a DNA, a text to DNA converter? Uh, so I've been focusing for the last five years on DNA and uh, more recently in the past year and a half or two years I've been focusing on detecting DNA and uh, making DNA. And I've come up with a few ideas and I've, I've done a few experiments, uh, started some projects that I've open source, that are open source. Uh, they haven't come to fruition yet, but uh, they're in progress for sure. So the latest thing that I've been working on is uh, DNA synthesis. And DNA synthesis, uh, because it's really expensive right now and uh, it's not something that people think that they can do, it's something that the industry and academia thinks that belongs in some huge warehouse core facility that, you know, nobody makes their own DNA, it's just more efficient to order it from the big factory. Uh, but I don't think that's true because every cell in our body makes DNA by eating, you know, McDonald's, which is like a dollar for a hamburger. So uh, there's got to be a way to do it, you know, approach biology, you know, cell division, DNA replication, synthesis, uh, price-wise. Because today it's like, you know, 30 cents a base pair. Uh, for like 30 cents I could get, you know, a lot of nucleic acid from a piece of food. So, um, there are some, you know, complications with that mentality because DNA isn't really synthesized in cells, uh, de novo, like 
you know, from a text file or from some other molecule, uh, it's replicated and it's changed or added to by being mutated. So uh, you kind of have a chicken and the egg problem if you start asking, well, where did the first DNA sequence come from? Uh, and that, there's a whole, you know, there's probably a whole textbook or five on that topic. But uh, in the beginning, there was a DNA sequence and it was copied and copied, and every once in a while there'd be an error. Once, you know, one thing would get changed, or one thing would get added or not added, you know, we get skipped, and things break, and then we have something called emergent properties, which, you know, it's like, why do traffic jams happen when there aren't any accidents, and, you know, all the, all the red lights are timed properly at the exit. It just happens. It's, it's just something, you know, feedback in the system of drivers, it's just not all coordinated. So, um, emergent property of DNA mutation is, if you believe in evolution, um, you know, us and bananas and monkeys and, you know, we all share like 99% of the same DNA, but we're all very different. So, there are some natural ways that approach actual synthesis of a new piece of DNA and um, and those are they're generally used for like capping the end of messenger RNA molecules. So when you have a gene and you want to turn it into a protein, it gets transcribed into RNA, and then it gets like hardened a little bit by putting a protein on one end. Uh, maybe it's not a protein; it might be something else. But one end has some hard modification, so it's not chemically active as much. And the other end has this long string of uh, A, this amino acid, uh, the nucleic acid A, it's called a poly A tail. Um, so where does this poly A tail come from? It's from an, or, uh, an enzyme that's similar to the DNA copying enzyme, but it doesn't require a template strand and it only adds A. It doesn't add A, G, C, or T. It only adds A. So now, we've, now I've found an enzyme that, okay, it, it only adds one nucleic acid. It's discriminatory against the rest of them. And, uh, and it doesn't require a template, which means if I just add this enzyme with some nucleic acid, it's, you know, and maybe a little bit of starter piece, a couple nucle nucleotides long, it's going to make this, like, N you know, X number long DNA that's all A's. So maybe there's a way to look at that structure of the molecule and look at the structure of the other replication molecules called polymerases in general and figure out, okay, why does it only add A? Oh, you know, and, and all these enzyme operations, they're really just really tiny tools. So if the screwdriver bit doesn't fit in the screw, it doesn't turn. So if the enzyme, if the protein has some like extra carbon sticking off in one, you know, volume of space, then another molecule might not be able to fit inside there. Uh, I can't wear a four-finger glove, but a four-finger person could. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, and, and that's, that's a common analogy. It's like a lock and key mechanism of, of proteins and small molecules, or proteins and other proteins. Uh, so there's also chemical synthesis. So that, that's sort of experimental, and that's going to require you know another 10 or 20 years or 30 years of research to, to figure that out and to make it like a really usable system for making DNA. But if, if and when it works, it's going to be just as cheap as you know, going and buying any or any material that has nucleic acid in it and you know, chopping it up into little bits, separating it, and then, you know. Anyway, uh, the alternative that is real and existing today is uh, chemical, you know, laboratory synthesis, uh, organic synthesis, and that has um, there's a cycle of reactions 
And because DNA is a chain, the cycle is something like take a block, add another block, fuse them together, rinse everything away, bring another block in, fuse them together. Um, and there's activation steps and protection steps so that other reactions, like it can't get added to the back side of the DNA. It can only get added to the front side of the DNA. Um, and the DNA can only extend by one nucleotide at a time. Uh, like, like if you're stacking Legos on top of each other, the new Lego that you put on back every time would have a flat cap that didn't have any little, little bumps coming out of it. And then you take the cap off, put that cap on your next single Lego, bring it back, stick it on, you know, now you have. And so in the one reaction, when you have all these different single Legos in this one, you know, stack of Legos, because that cap is on there, multiple Legos can't stack at the same time. And until you remove, you know, until you rinse everything away and pull that cap off. Um, so I don't know what everybody's level of understanding is. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know, is there any questions at this point? So how long does that existing process take to, say, make a plasmid? Um, I think it's about a minute per nucleotide or a minute and a half per nucleotide on like the 10-year-old machines, which are comparable in reaction time for the current generation stuff, but the current generation stuff is a lot bigger and a lot more parallelized and, uh, you know, instead of it being the size of a mini fridge, you know, they have machines that are a third of this room size and they're making, you know, not a couple milliliters, but, you know, liters of the same DNA strand. Uh, or, you know, not, not even necessarily plasmid, uh, because most of the, the, the synthesis reactions they have an inherent error rate because, uh, do you know what open loop and closed loop feedback is? Does anybody not know what that is? Uh, so if you're driving in your car and you're like, okay, I want to go 40 miles an hour, you look at the pedal, you look at the speedometer, when you get to 40, you just stop looking at the speedometer and don't move your foot. And you're like, well, it was at 40, so, you know, even if I'm going up a hill, I'm, I'm going to assume it's still at 40. Or if I'm going down a hill, I'm still going 40. Uh, closed loop feedback is when you're always looking at the sit and you're like, oh man, I need to give it more gas. Oh, I need to take less gas. You know, I need to remove gas. Um, so DNA synthesis is open loop right now. They don't check to see if an addition has been made because they're adding to millions of molecules in the same container, in the same pot. So you can't, they're not working with a single DNA molecule and looking at it, like make sure it grows longer. Oh, it didn't grow longer, we better, you know, repeat that step again. Oh, it still didn't work, you know, let's do it a third time. Oh, okay, there it worked. Or, you know, what maybe something rate? happened, uh, and this is very rare in this synthesis, but you know, maybe a double addition happened somehow. Sure. Like the cap wasn't, uh, the cap wasn't properly, completely on. The, the incoming nucleotide. The error rate very high right now? Uh, well, because it's, you know, the error rate is statistical, it's multiplied per reaction, so even though the error rate's like 1% or something, or half of a percent, as you multiply that, you, the error increases really, really fast. Because uh, you know, half percent times half percent, or, or the, you you would want to do the inverse, like 99.95 percent times 99, or you know, 0.95, or, and each each nucleotide would be you know another multiplication step. Um, you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned that it would be difficult to create DNA de novo where you're starting from scratch and you want this unique sequence, and so you add one nucleotide at a time. That I can understand that being hard, but if the end result is going to be sort of something that's going to reproduce and similar to the existing species, you don't need to start de novo. You can start pretty much with something that you're close to and then put in your tweaks that you want. So how much easier would it be to begin with a functioning species and run, I don't, I don't even know what the sequence would be, sort of like a PCR that would introduce your plasmids to do your, your dragging and dropping, but you start from 
like a much larger hole versus de novo? Um, it depends how you know. Are your tweaks other pieces of DNA that you've already you already have, and you're just inserting them? If your tweaks are totally de novo, then you still have to come back to DNA synthesis. Sure, maybe you only need 10 base pairs of tweakage, but if they don't exist anywhere, you still have to synthesize those. And it's still expensive today. And the machines that exist are still in some factory that requires as one of the steps being mailed to you or carried in a tube from that machine to another rather than all being in the same unit and like, you know, I want to mutate this gene a million times. Uh, you know, that means I need a million different pieces of tweaked DNA. You don't want to have to carry a million tubes, you know. You want to, the output of that machine to go right into the next experiment. Uh, well, when, when Venner came up with his half million base pair, did he go de novo or did he start with something that was... He started with a, he started with a text file and broke the text file up into small chunks okay. and then put that text file into a machine and what came out of that machine get put into a plasmid and then amplified in E. coli and then all the plasmids extracted from the E. coli and then uh, PCR sequencing reaction is done or you know, next gen and then each of those plasmids are sequenced and then the right one is kept. So the, it's closed loop feedback, but it's on the order of like maybe four days if you're in a really hot shot lab. Maybe, you know, that would take a single person. I mean, if you were like DIY or a startup company or something, like you've got no chance unless you've got a million dollar grant or, you know, a couple hundred thousand at least. Because the feedback time is still one, two, three, four weeks, just to figure out one stretch of, you know, 500 base pairs. Or you can order out, but I mean, that, that isn't what Venner did, essentially. I mean, they did order out, but that ordering out was still part of the experiment. You know, that, if you count the time, if you, if you don't look away from, oh, I'm just getting DNA, that's still going on in the background at these factories. They're, you know, still doing all this roundabout check work that it's it's long but it doesn't we haven't gotten to the next level yet. So um, there are some interesting ways that you can synthesize single molecules and that is instead of having a, a reaction pot that's you know this big or even this big, you have it like a billion times smaller than that. And you have it such that uh, your reaction volume is small enough that maybe only one molecule can really can really fit in uh, a certain way. So if the DNA is, uh, I think it's like 30 nanometers wide, or 20-ish, like 20 to 30 nanometers wide, the double helix. Uh, if that, if your if your tube that you're putting it through is you know, even a micron, you're already at like, you know, tube is this wide. It's, it's wider than the, the whiteboard can be. Um, so if you can make this tube really small on the order of like a couple hundred nanometers or, or 50 nanometers, then when you push a bunch of DNA from a big pot back here through this tube, you know, you're, you're going to have a greater chance of there only being one molecule in there. Um, and if you dilute this pot back here that you're pushing through, Full DNA, you know, it'll there. You can trap trap one molecule in there, um, and then you know if you can attach that to the side of the wall. Now you have a piece of DNA in there, and you can flow in single nucleotides at a time, uh, and hope that your nucleotide happens to be right in the vicinity where an organic reaction can occur, and it'll couple. Uh, or if you were trying to do this with like that enzyme terminal transferase, I, I sort of mentioned it. Um, maybe I didn't use that word, but it, it, that terminal transferase is a polymerase that doesn't require a template, but it doesn't just add A's like the, the poly A polymerase does. It has A, G, C, or T, but it's indiscriminate. It doesn't have any, you know, maybe certain nucleotides fit a little bit better, so they have not, you know, 
an even spread, but it's pretty close of, of which enzyme, which nucleotides it'll add. So if you had an enzyme floating in here in like, say, a nanopore sieve, these exist that have tunable pore sizes. Um, if you had a sieve back here, like a, a filter, then you could have your DNA, which is big enough to get through the filter, but it's, it's, it's attached here on the wall. And then you can have your enzyme, which is going to be really big. Um, and then, you know, you flow a single nucleotide in here, and this would be the terminal transferase. And, and you, you would still have to wait for diffusion to happen, because if you're only adding one molecule and the, the you know, chamber's this big, it has to, has to diffuse all over before it, it hits right the sweet spot where a reaction can occur. And if you've got, if, you know, your enzyme can't be attached because this DNA molecule is extending, um, so your, 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 pro, your M is going to be diffusing, your nucleotide is going to be diffusing, this is going to be, the end of this is going to be flapping around, so you've got like three somewhat, not, not random, but chaotic, and so, so seemingly random that um, it's going to be really low probability of them happening without enough time just sitting there reacting, uh, even though the reaction itself you know, happens in nanoseconds. Diffusion takes a really long time. So, and, and there are single molecule detection techniques where like you can point a laser at this and it's like a gold or a silver bottom and you point a laser at it and you look at the beam that bounces off and then you put that through a spectrometer and uh, which, which sorts the light frequencies uh, spatially, like if you look Look at like a rainbow. That's white light being broken up by water droplets this way out. Um, so, and, and use this, that. That's called surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Um, but this, you need a gold bottom, and the DNA molecule has to be there. So it's like it's too much of a hassle. That that won't work uh, very easily unless we have really <laughs> precise nanofabrication techniques, which we can't really build single atom at a time right now. Uh, <coughs> Intel is doing like I think 22 nanometer or 15 nanometer transistor processes right now, which is pretty small, but there's still margins of error in that. So, uh, but that's still pretty good. But you know, that's, that's transistors. It's not like a tube with a, a, an empty volume going through it. So, uh, so at the last talk get together that I stood up in front of and talked about this stuff uh, about a month and a half ago, um, some people mentioned, well, hey, why can't we, you know, what, what if you could do a bulk reaction where you still got a billion DNA molecules and uh, and you you know you add a nucleotide and you're not sure that a nucleotide has actually been added. Um, but, you know, there's this thing called gel electrophoresis that sorts DNA molecules by size. So, what if you did a, a DNA reaction, you added a single nucleotide, separated the DNA by size, cut that chunk out that's, you know, N plus one of your DNA molecule, cut that chunk out, and put that DNA into your next reaction. Now you're, you're filtering out your error at every addition step. Um, and that, that is actually something I haven't seen, probably because it's traditionally gel electrophoresis is this big, and DNA synthesis is mailed to you, so people like haven't really tried this, or or people that do have a DNA synthesizer, um, they put out you know a vial, they spit out a vial of stuff. It's not like they just, people just haven't done that before that I've seen. So. Um, so that, that is really cool to me. What's, what do you start with in this? In this? Situation, yeah. Do you just order whatever um, you board or? No, you would probably, you would, you would get like a, this could be like a, a, an iron bead that's coated in plastic and then the, uh, the outside of the plastic coating is, is, uh, 
modified with carboxyl groups like COOH. And uh, so this is on the, the plastic bead. And these are reactive with uh, pretty good, pretty easy to use uh, kits that you can add nucleic acid or protein to this right here. A couple simple steps. So you would start with a bead like this and it has an iron core. And uh, so now you can put a magnet up here, hold your bead, and uh, with this right here, you would just, instead of adding DNA and doing the, the fixative step to attach a long string of DNA, you could just add like a single nucleotide. So then you'd have, I don't know where it gets added to exactly, this might come off, but then you'd have, you know, uh, an A to start with, mm -hmm. attached here or something. Uh, and then you put this in here and you do your synthesis reaction. When you add one nucleotide, what to stop it from adding multiple times and adding a bunch of A's in So, um, nucleotide without a base is pentose sugar, which means that it's five carbons. So there's one, two, three, four, and then there's a fifth carbon here. And uh, the nu nucleus, the, the base, the A, G, C, or T attaches up here. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's numbered by the IUPAC system, which uh, it's like a, it's a naming scheme for molecules. Instead of calling this nucleic acid, it's, you know, one, three, five, ribulose. I don't know what it is, but it's some, you know, really long and it's, 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 it's machine readable, let's say that. So this is like the most electronegative atom, and that's generally where numbering starts from. So this would be the one prime carbon, this would be the two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. And uh, if you know anything about DNA, you'll have heard, you know, oh, the polymerase goes from five prime to three prime. It, you know, it copies five prime to three prime. And that's, that's talking about which way the molecules are getting linked together. So uh, up here, attached to this 5' prime carbon, there are um, a couple of phosphoryl uh, phosphate groups, which is uh, P, PO4, and uh, like this, like that. And then there's, there's the same thing repeated a couple another. This thing again. So, so this, these three phosphates are they have a lot of energy in the bond, and uh, when another nucleotide comes in, it has you know this, this three prime end uh, reacts with these, and the energy is enough from breaking this bond to attach the five prime to the other three prime through this, this oxygen. Uh, or maybe it's on this oxygen. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's on this oxygen. It has a phosphodiester backbone. Uh, so, so you would have uh, here an O, P, O, O, and then you'd have your Of your this is the five prime of the other nucleotide, uh, and it's the phosphodiester bond. These are ester linkages and diester phospho. Uh, there's electrons. I think that's the right right number. It might be that many, but there's some negative charge here because there's some electrons that aren't bonded in those oxygen. So DNA has a negative charge generally uh, overall. It's and uh, that's how electrophoresis works. You put this molecule in a gel, you put the negative terminal and battery here, you put the positive terminal here, and the DNA, negative, positive, opposites track, DNA goes that way in the gel electrophoresis. Um, I don't know why I was talking about that, but... Uh, oh, 
um, how do you keep it from double attaching? How do you keep it from double attaching? So, so in a in a synthetic reaction, they don't use phos, the ATP over here, um, or the, the it was an ATP, but um, <coughs> doesn't use the triphosphate for the energy. It uses something called. Uh, It's, there's a couple different ways to do it, but basically it uses a different chemistry and um, it, it doesn't go in 5' or 3' prime. it goes in the opposite direction. So there is basically, uh, so if you have, this, this is your starting, this is your, your magnetic feed down here, we'll say, or whatever, um, and you don't have this other nucleotide here yet, This five prime side is reactive. It's attached to a solid support, so it's not moving around. It's it's reactive, and then you flush in nucleotides. But the nucleotides that you flush in, um, the three prime right here has been has been made, or rather, so the three prime is activated so that it links up with the five prime. But the five prime up here has been deactivated. It has a protecting group on it. And uh, once the linkage is made between the two of them, all the free nucleotides are flushed out, and then uh, a decapper or deprotectant is brought in, which takes that X away and makes it good to go for the next reaction. And then you flush in your nucleotide. Uh, that are capped, reactive at three prime. It links up. This is no longer reactive. All the free nucleotides are flushed out. Deprotectant comes in, deprotects that. New nucleotides are brought in. And the cycle continues. Uh, so I pretty efficient. What? Seem pretty efficient. Except that you have the diffusion to worry about and this I'm showing you a blown up image of making a single molecule, but in reality there are like billions of molecules being made, or you know, tens, hundreds of billions. So since they're all floating around in this reaction chamber and diffusion is what's, what's limiting your efficiency, if one nucleotide, if, if you know, one percent or half of a percent of the billion molecules don't get the addition working happening, uh, then on the next synthetic reaction, on the next cycle, half percent of your molecules are garbage already. But they don't check every cycle. So by the end of 50 cycles, you've got a whole, uh, you got a whole clan of, you know, similar but different molecules. And uh, a large portion of those are, are good, but they're all mixed in and you've got to separate them. And separation time is, you know, four day to four week process. So you how propose one or two microfluidic and then do a check on every single reaction. Yeah, not and not not nanometer scale, just just micron scale microfluidics. Um, I think ten by ten by forty microns. Well, be you before we get into the microfluidics approach. The the way nature is adding a nucleotide at times is this template happening while well, sort of you, you could use the ribosome as the engine that's doing the, the addition. Have people been one, one race? Well, I mean, ribosome is making proteins, but it's also, I mean, could be tweaked to be the tool that adds the next ATCG onto you know your your DNA. Uh, so, I would think that you'd be better you'd better start with the polymerase because. The ribosome is optimized for catalyzing amino acid linkages, not nucleic acid. There's a different structure. Well, I mean, the, the functionally, ribosome, but for the purpose of, for us, we want to add nucleic acid. Now. Yeah, so I would start with, we already have a crystal structure of a terminal transferase, dideoxy terminal transferase. Um, we already have a crystal structure of that and like a host of other polymerases. So these are all adding nucleotides. Um, we have knowledge of uh, photoisomerization photo uh, linkages. So like um, 
you have like a, I don't remember what a ketone looks like right now, but um, ketone, enol, isomerization, it's like, it's a certain linkage where you have a carbon here and then like, I think it's maybe another oxygen and something. I, I don't exactly know, but basically this double bond shifts around and that's called isomerization. So it goes from having a hydrogen here and then, you know, that disappears and the hydrogen pops up there and it, it's certain, you know, certain things induce this shift or it's, it's just random with heat. Um, but they found photoisomer, photoisomerizational groups where if you pulse it with a beam of light, then that double bond swaps over there and because electrons are moving around, it changes the, the whole uh, electron 3D space, which changes the conformation of the protein. So if the double bonds here, you know, double bonds are rigid, they can't rotate. So if you pulse it with blue light and all of a sudden it can rotate, maybe it was, it was bound up and it could, couldn't add a G because it was, it was kinked the wrong way. Right. Pulse it with light, now, now it's free to rotate, now it can add a G. Well, how about this? And not add ACT. Well, what if you, okay, the, this, the, the functional equivalent of ribosome that has the ability to add additional chains over time, but the problem is it's based, its current function is based off the template where it's just doing a one for one, you know, uh, three, it, one. you know, right, something, th three, three to one, three to one, three to one. Well, what if you have the, the functional aspects of ribosome that allows you to add additional chains, but you use a trick similar to what you just mentioned, where you pulse it with something that forces it to do a hard conformation, like a, some bending thing, which will only let it add chains of a certain A, A, A. And then another pulse to tweak it so that it's only doing G, 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 G. And then, you know, so that, you know, you, you've got a desire of a sequence that you want, but that keys off the pulses that you're giving it so that this mechanism is creating a whole sequence of chains because it, it'll be too fidgety to, to have one chain per pulse. But what if you tweak it, pulse it, so that it's making a whole series of the same chain and then you pulse it and then it goes to the next in your sequence. And then you have your de novo sequence, except it's a whole duplicate. Instead of ATCG, which is your desired sequence, you have AA, TGG, GGG. And then the next step would be put it through a similar <coughs> trick where you're feeding in this long chain that has the dupes, but every time it does a toggle to the new flavor, it pops out to, so that you're, after the second iteration, the duplicates are just triggering singles so that you, you got your single sequence. I, I think I think um, I think you can do single nucleotides at a time uh, and don't, don't have to go through the whole duplicate thing like you're saying. Um, like the crystal structure of the terminal transferase, it sort of looks like a baseball mitt and uh, like I guess like this as, as I remember it and the, the DNA is going through this way, or the DNA is like right there, it's being held, and then a free nucleotide comes in and this, this finger sort of pops it in to the reaction site and, and sort of all at once in that popping action, action it, it condenses the molecule, the nucleotide to the rest of the molecule. And then and it's sort of like a, a semi-automatic pistol, or actually an automatic pistol. Um, you know, it pops it in, it, it fires when it condenses, releases some energy, and then pushes and ratchets it this way. So now you have another nucleotide there, and the finger opens back up, and it's ready to accept another nucleotide, pop, ratchet. And uh, there's actually been some, some experiments or some research <coughs> that uh, they showed. They, uh, I believe they attached, they had two plates, and they attached a polymerase over here and like a starting RNA, or maybe it was a ribosome and they were making, they were making protein. But basically, uh, they constrained the spacing on these plates. So 
whatever it was, uh, I don't know if it was the polymerase making a, an RNA molecule from DNA or a ribosome making protein from RNA, but whatever it was over here, it has that rationing, you know, both polymerase and ribosome have that rationing action. So what they did was they, they had each molecule tied, or, or a protein is a molecule, but um, they had the, the two sides of this reaction tied on these plates, and the plates were on screws. And so they would add, they would add the stuff, you know, the protein, uh, the, the amino acids or nucleic acids, and it would add one, but then it couldn't ratchet because, uh, well, I guess, I guess if it's making it this way, it would, it would push it up. So it was, uh, it was, it was, I don't know, it was one of these ways. But basically, if it's put, if it's pulling it through this way and making a, a, a new, new strand here, the old strand's going this way, so it needs to pull this way um, to, to get the next, you know, frame in to read or to, to, to replicate. So they would add stuff, it would, it would add, it would add a monomer to the polymer, but then because it was affixed on these plates, it couldn't ratchet, and then they would they would turn the screw and give it a little more space, and they would see, you know, exactly how much how many nanometers of screw turn caused for the, until the, the molecule got one monomer bigger, and they would they were actually able to see. And I, they may have also had like a like a, a tension meter over here to see what the force that the the enzyme was pulling on the molecule, like the ratcheting force. Um, so they effectively, they, they, you know, just by tugging on the molecule while feeding through, they, they did it, they made it from, you know, zipping through to one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Uh, so if instead of pulling that, you know, you just, whatever, whatever, you know, find a key linkage in the protein that's twisting around when it's ratcheting, put a photoisomerase, you know, Blue, blue light photoisomerizable, you know, unit on uh, bond there, and uh, and you know only when it pulse, only when you pulse with blue light now does it does it you know able to relax and and ratchet through, and now you've got your you know stepwise okay go ahead next one next one next one, uh, and, and like I was saying, that the, the terminal transferase sort of has like this, this finger action, um, where it, you have your molecule, you have a new nucleotide, it pops on and then it ratchets and it opens back up. Uh, it, it really is sort of it sort of looked like a finger to me on a hand, where it had this sort of uh, bending action. So maybe you put a photo I some photo I some I don't know what how to pronounce that, but. Maybe put that that photo conforming group on this on my knuckle here, and then only when I pulse it is it is it able to pop a new one on. And then maybe instead of having just one thumb that can accept all four nucleotides, I just add four thumbs onto my hand, and each one of those has a different color isomer, isomerization group. So now I can have a whole mix of nucleotides A, C, C, and G on the same pot. But only when I pulse with red, green, blue, yellow, does it, you know, one of my four fingers goes, okay, A, T, G, C, you know, A, T, you know, et cetera. But so they have the, the molecules that are sensitive to four different kinds of pulses? Um, I'm not sure. They, there probably is at least a couple. I don't know if there's four or five. Uh, but I, I imagine they do, or it's, well, you know, it's, the mechanics of it is relatively figured out where it's achievable if you wanted to apply. You know, if you wanted to do that, you could get to it with the right team and you know, uh, an achievable short period of time. You know, whether that's a month or two, three, four, or five years, I don't know. But I think I think that stuff is relatively. Um, I don't know. I I don't know if it's well figured out or not, but I. I think it probably is. Uh, so that would be that would be awesome. A controllable polymerase, uh, a digital digitally controllable polymerase would be great. Uh, that would you know then you could really just take a piece of food 
do a new, you know, do a DNA extraction on it, add uh, add uh, nucleases, you know, chop up the DNA, purify all the nucleic acid out of the sample, activate it with the, the ATP, and you know, flush it into your enzyme chamber, and just go pulse pulse your light. You know, then your your reagents are essentially just coming from like Mr. Fusion and Back to the Future. Whatever it is, dump it in, get the DNA out. Um, so what I've been doing for the past uh, nine months or so is, uh, well, I, I've, been I've been reading about and learning about microfluidics for probably about three years now. And uh, I took a lab course at the school I was going to uh, in microelectronic fabrication. So mm -hmm. I, I made some transistors on a piece of bare, bare silicon. And I, I got sort of an idea of some of the micro scale fabrication techniques. And, um, and nobody was really doing microfluidics at my school, but uh, I tried to pursue it anyway. And um, I ended up using a, a versa laser, universal systems versa laser, desktop CNC laser cutter, CO2, uh, like 10.6 micron frequency beam or wavelength. And uh, just I have a test pattern, a microfluidic test pattern with, it's, I think I made it in uh, Inkscape and uh, FPG. And basically all that is is a bunch of different line thicknesses, you know, different number of pixels in Inkscape. You know, this way, this thick, this thick, this thick, and then like I think I did some curves, like a corner or something like that. And uh, and the Air Force has a similar uh, like test pattern for uh, I think visual systems. So like take you know, optical replication. How how well do all the lines reproduce when you keep taking pictures of the photo that comes out and. Uh, so I, I printed a pattern like this on this silicone called PDMS, which uh, it's, it's basically like RTV that you buy at an auto parts store, um, room temperature vulcanization silicone, which means that silicone oil exists, um, and vulcanization is when you uh, cross-link the silicone molecules, and it causes, creates like a, a, an elastic structure, an elastic matrix structure, um, and I think vulcanization was discovered by Goodyear, maybe, whoever was the first guy that made really good tires. <laughs> but uh, um, so I printed this pattern with just a, a off-the-shelf laser cutter. And I, I looked at it under a microscope. I looked at it under an interferometer, which uh, it an interferometer uses um, a laser that is really a really really good laser, and the frequency of light is very consistent, and uh, and the beam is really straight. So if you if you shoot a laser beam at a surface and it bounces back. It's going to, uh, there's a thing called interference, and it can either interfere constructively or destructively with itself. And uh, basically, uh, <coughs> like, uh, if you have a laser coming this way, it's going to bounce off and go this way. And if you have like a beam splitter right here, a half silver mirror, half the beam would go through this way, half the beam would bounce this way. But this difference right here, the, the, the difference in distance between this reflection surface and this reflection surface, if it's not an integral number of the wavelength, if you then combine these beams back together, if you put a mirror here, a mirror here, um, or actually rather like I have a prism there, and I think they come out here. Um, if this isn't an integral 
number of wavelengths distance, the, the beams would, the, the waves, like, just cancel each other out, and you wouldn't have any light coming out of here. Um, whereas if it was if it was off by half of a half of a wave period, the when it came when they combined together, the the the, uh, the phase of the light beam would be would match up, and they would constructively interfere. But since you just split it in half, it's not really giving you you're not making light out of nowhere. Um, but if they were, if they were, say, like I said, off by, uh, if they were completely out of phase, they would totally cancel each other out. So if there was a dip here and a peak there, you know, when you, when you, uh, it's not multiplication, but it's, uh, just adding them, right? You just cancel them out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So you know, and the output of this would neither be, it wouldn't be a squished wave, which is almost the same as if you got the same. So that's why. Uh, like right. uh, where is it? I'm trying to be cancellation. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> sure. <case cancellation>. sure. <laughs> um, it's easy to so it, so because of this property, if you had a sensor, a light sensor here, you can you can tell the distance between these two plates depending on how bright it is down here. Because you know the brightness of your original beam and depending on how much interference is or isn't happening, you can tell, oh, it's, they're, you know, they're perfectly one, you know, one period away from each other or they're half of a period away from each other because there's half as much light or, uh, you know, if they're, if they're totally opposite phases, you'll get no light or very low light out here. So, if you move this plate, the amount of light at your sensor would change. And instead of having a plate here, if I put my 3D channel made of silicone and I move it back and forth, now the reflecting is reflecting down here, and I'm moving it, it's reflecting down here, and then all of a sudden it's reflecting up here when I, you know, I'm scanning it through. And if I if I stitch together my sensor reading, I can get a 3D profile. And you, you, Paul trying to explain. So what? So <laughs> <laughs> moving, moving that. Twist. They don't actually move it. They just use a camera chip. Right. So it's got a bunch of pixels instead of sliding it. So then, through software, you could recreate the geometry of what the real surface is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You do it, yeah. and you can you can make an interferometer really easily with like a CD uh, and a CD case and a laser <laughs> a handheld laser pointer. Um, what is this called? A Michelson interferometer. If you Google twenty dollar Michelson interferometer, you'll see a little video on some not YouTube video site. Um, <laughs> and it, you know, it shows this like super glue, some I don't know gum bands or something, and a CD and a CD case, and and he's got it shown on his wall. You can see you can see the interference pattern, and it, it looks it looks like. It's called a Moray pattern, and it's, it's like, it's bands of light. And uh, as, as he bumps the table, the light bands move back and forth. And they move back and forth because that sensor is only at one, you know, your, if your sensor is just in the center here, when these move, this moving back and forth is actually variations in brightness. You know, dark light, dark light, dark light. Um, and that moving pattern on the wall when you know, they grab onto the table, uh, it's basically showing it's moving, you know, a certain number of man nanometers. There's a nanometer scale vibration on that optical system. Uh, and then you use that to do three dimensional profile. Uh, so I, I did this, I made these microfluidic channels with a desktop CNC laser cutter, and uh, the 3D profile showed that they were junk. They were the, the walls looked sort of like the edge of a block of Swiss cheese, and um, I attributed that to a number of things. Uh, it was a desktop laser cutter made for cutting at the smallest, like balsa wood. You know, like really, like maybe maybe you could cut a, a 250 micron line, like thick section could could be cut out. Um, so that's, you know, a quarter of a millimeter. 
So that's fine for model rocketry, um, whatever, remote control airplanes, putting together your MakerBot or your, your open PCR wooden case with all the, the tongue and groove stuff. But um, 250 microns is really big for microfluidics. It's, it's right on the upper edge. Um, and the walls look like Swiss cheese, which I attributed to uh, because it's made for millimeter scale stuff, not micron scale stuff. Uh, the stepper motors aren't, aren't doing small enough steps. The laser is pulsing. It's not continuous wave. Even though a CO2 laser can be run in a continuous wave fashion, which means there's always photons coming out, and it's, it's going to be, if you don't turn the laser off, it's going to be an endless stream of, of uh, photon wave stuff. So, uh, but a lot of them, to, instead, of, instead of controlling the current going to the, uh, the lasing chamber, they just pulse width modulate the full power. So instead of getting a nice wave like that, or if I just turn the current down, you know, a less loud wave, um, it's actually full power, but then it's like, So if, if, I'm, if I'm shooting light that has enough energy, these sections of light have enough energy to burn my stuff, but they're pulsed, and then I've got a stepper motor, which is a ch 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 If these are out of phase, it's not going to produce a, smooth, a totally smooth channel. So, um, and you know, that, that machine was my school, and I couldn't mess with it. I couldn't tweak it. And the people, it was like in the model airplane club room, and they were like, oh, you can't put that, you know, little reflective stuff in there. It's going to go back into the lasing chamber. It could damage the optics. And I'm like, well, the laser works by having photons in there bouncing around. Like, it's not, back reflection is probably not going to hurt it. But um, these guys weren't chemists. They were Spin casting the DPMS directly onto yeah. to a, um, like a DVE disc. I didn't know. I, I used DVD silicon player. wafer. Yeah, if you have like, like a Blu-ray player, then you would get the fine uh, resolution you need. Because I DVD thought of that using the track. Because then also the optics. Because but then you, then you have to, then you have to uh, increase the power on the dial. Then you have to convert your SVG to polar coordinates, right? Mm -hmm. Which and then and well, because I don't want pulse action, if I'm trying to make a square on a rotating DVD in polar coordinates, as my CD is spinning in this direction, my laser is only, you know, it's only right here. Actually, well, if I'm trying to make a square here, but my but my laser head can only move in this direction. Then as it's spinning, when it comes around, I got a pulse, move the laser, pulse, you know, mm -hmm. which I don't want to do. I want it to be continuous wave, and uh, so I think the problem you have is because the laser, the optics on the laser is not that good. So the spot size is somewhere around five mil, and uh, but the, the spot, spot size doesn't the spot size on this. I mean, something like a Blu-ray player, the optics is a lot finer. It's, cool. yeah. it's a lot, so you get a lot tighter. Yeah, it's like it's like. Um, it's a 400 nanometer wave, 405 nanometer right. wave. But the optics um, itself, it's short, it's short focal. The track spacing on a Blu-ray, I think, is 600 nanometers. I know, but you get the impression spacing off of it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like 600 nanometer track spacing. But, I mean, there's, there's also error correction in reading a DVD. Well, yeah, so, yeah. so yeah. you know, it's, it's pretty big. It's like, I think it's... I, I don't know what it is, but I think it's like one byte to 20 bytes or something worth of error correction. Um, so that means that even though you're right, it, this, the DVD has a spiral on it, and I can convert my square to polar coordinates and pulse it, uh, that head, even though it might be averaging reading that track, it, it still has error correction built in so that if it overshoots the track, it's got enough time where it can react to that voice coil and move move the head back to the track. Well, what if you're, um, well, 
Okay, so the challenge is that the physical size of the width of the um, helix coil DNA is too narrow to be able to get down to that resolution with your, your toys. W what if you generate this sequence that you want of the ATCG, ultimately it's going to wind up in DNA, but through, through your toys, you get, um, apply your technique to a much bigger molecule where you do your pulse code and your tunnels and your, your ion gripper onto a big fatter molecule that's more uh, accessible but still able to persist your, your sequence that you want. And then once you get it into this bigger molecule and then do some magic to um, walk through that and take that sequence that you've got on a bigger molecule and somehow take it down, you know, chemically to like, the... Like Richard Feynman, like just yeah. having your machine make smaller and smaller exactly. arms? Exactly. Uh, maybe, but I, I think, I think I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, you could have a bulk reaction, have one nucleotide and then do an electrophoresis and pull off the, the right side. And if it's the right size, you know that extension has occurred. So you have, that's a possible way to have closed loop for every synthesis cycle. Um, so, picoliter, uh, so um, picoliter DNA synthesis has been accomplished, and uh, that means that the, the volume of the reaction chamber is on a picoliter scale. And I think 10 microns by 10 microns by 40 microns. I think that those dimensions box is like seven or ten picoliters. Uh, so ten by ten by forty is, is basically what I'm trying to achieve with with. Uh, I'm, I've been designing and working with a couple of people on the internet to uh, build a custom custom laser cutter essentially. Um, and uh, just using, you know, just downscaling everything, using a finer thread screw, maybe using, um, for a while I was looking at using like a 400 step per revolution stepper motor. Uh, but stepper motors have some issues and, you know, resonation. And, Nathan, it's approaching 8 o'clock. I just wanted people to be able to have more questions because clearly we're just generating some questions and ideas. Two things. What's next for you in terms of this, and how can people contact you? Um, maybe that. I'm moving to Portland, Oregon in the next three weeks. So that's my next thing. My yeah. next thing is putting all my stuff in a box. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I just ordered a Blu-ray laser, uh, a laser diode from a 12x Blu-ray DVD writer, a uh, Blu-ray writer. Um, it's like 405 nanometer wavelength lens uh, laser. Uh, and I'm going I'm to measure the angle of the beam and then put that into some uh, open source optical ray tracing simulation software. Uh, and where can people find all this information or about you or contact you? DIY. Where does uh, that say? DIYHPL.us slash. I don't know. It's always in my phone. If, if you do, if you Google, if you Google this site colon DOH plus, and then just type laser underscore etcher. If you know how to, if you know how to Google that well, you'll find it. All of your and what's the next, I mean, what is your vision ultimately? What would you like to do? So I'd like to have a, a, some, if not laser cutter, there are other ways to make micro stuff at a really fine scale. Um, there's a, a company that for not too much money uh, will print uh, a photo negative for, at 10,000 DPI using uh, a laser. Mm -hmm. And they can do really, really, I mean, 10,000 DPI is 25,000 divided by 10,000 with a 2.5 microns. Is that right? Yeah, so um, it's, if I can't get a laser cutter to work the way I want it to at a fine scale, so that I can iteratively and rapidly prototype microfluidics, because 
I don't, I, I don't have the time to take two, three years.